In this video, we're going to talk about spalding wood. We're going to talk about an introduction into a lot of different woods characteristics. We're going to talk about methods of cutting logs into lumber. We're going to talk about river tables. We're going to talk about log size and how that affects your efficiency on a sawmill. Then we're going to have an introduction into the tables that will show you how many board feet in a log and how much a log weighs. Then we're going to show you how to cut some bowl blanks out of logs. Then we're going to get into cutting cookies and chargers out of logs. Then we're going to show you how to seal your lumber so it won't crack. So stay tuned. You're going to get a lot out of this video. This piece of sycamore is spalding. This is uh, when it starts getting ripe. The uh, spalding is a rot fungus that gets in the wood. Some of them are good and some of them are bad. Some of them decorate the wood and some of them just rot the wood. Uh, we try to uh, grow the ones around here that decorate the wood on the thing. And this fruiting that you see is as it eats the carbohydrates or sugars out of the wood, once it gets kind of through with the wood, it'll start fruiting on the edges of it. And this stuff breaks off and blows in the wind and that's why this stuff is everywhere. I don't have to introduce it into the logs, I just have to create the conditions that uh, this, this fungus grows in, which is moisture and kind of shade. Uh, so we, we're going to have a whole segment on how to spall the wood. So we'll get back to that. Notice here, pith. This thing was cut around, but look at what it's doing from the pith. Be aware of that. Here, you can see some of the spalding already starting to show up. Here in that grain and that grain on that sycamore. Notice a while ago I was showing you those modular rays on sycamore. They're not showing on this because I'm not quarter sewing it. I would have to take a little piece of wood, right, cut right through there, and I would see those rays right on that surface. If I cut it right through there, because I'm the, the the actual grain of the wood is going almost vertical at that point. So that's where I would see those modular rays in sycamore. Big chunk of red oak. Uh, there was a whole group of these trees that blowed down in East Texas through some microbursts that went through a pine forest. Uh, east of here, closer to the Louisiana border, there is millions of acres of pine trees. And inside there is scattered various hardwoods. This one has to be red oak. And one of the unusual things is when that microburst come through there and hit those pine trees, the pine trees all flexed and bent over. These old big uh, oak trees that rolled them over in the ground, broke the root ball on them, and they were laying over, just rolled over in the ground. So I had one down there and got them. They're really great wood but it shows this, the difference between a hardwood tree that doesn't flex and no pine tree, it's like a willow pole. Uh, that's what saved those pine trees, because they were all standing straight back up and continue to grow when these were all laying on the ground. Again, this log has been sitting out for a while and it's darkened. You wouldn't want to cut lumber out of that. It'd be a lot better. you take your chainsaw and clean it up a little bit, now you got some good looking lumber and the ends don't look like they're rotted or browned out. I took a marker and showed you the pith here. Pith is slightly off on this one because apparently it was leaning a little bit, but that's not too bad. So one of the ways you can deal with the pith on this is Take and cut your lumber this way off of it. And you're, you're dealing with all compression wood here and all expansion wood here. And if you cut it this way, it won't warp as bad as if you try to go through compression wood and expansion wood by cutting the boards out of it that way. Different ways to cut wood, but be aware of all the problems inside the wood when you do this. And try to think of as a sawmiller how to uh, work around and roll the log and cut to deal with these issues because here's what's going to happen is if you just ignore that and you just throw logs on and start cutting them up you're going to produce lumber then somebody's going to want it 
And if they come by your lumber and they take it home and they put it in a stack and a few months later before they get to use it, they go look at it and it's all twisted junk, warped and everything, they're not gonna come to you to buy lumber no more. You've got to be aware of the wood grain, the characteristics of the logs. Uh, you know, there's a lot of difference between cutting pine logs and, and cutting black walnut logs, especially oak logs. Uh, you know, just here in Texas alone, there's 52 varieties of oak trees. And if you start cutting all of those oak trees the same, you have problems. A water oak tree cuts far different than a post oak tree. The end up results of it. So you've got to be aware of the grain and the characteristics of each type of wood if you're going to be a good sawmiller and produce good lumber for people that's going to do woodworking. As because I use a lot of the lumber I cut, one, I see those results as I make woodworking projects out of it, so it helps me work backwards to the sawmill and know better how to cut it up. And I'm trying to pass some of this on to you. Just don't be a sawmiller, just start cutting logs and ignoring all of these issues. I was showing you a red oak log. This is a post oak log. Here in Texas, we don't have the white oak that y'all know as northern white oak. What we have is post oak. It's, it's from the white oak family, but it's just a different wood. And why it's so different, it's cracked so bad. Uh, mostly saw, the big sawmills around here don't use it for anything but cross ties or firewood. And one, you can prevent this by cutting it early. Uh, one thing you want to do with post oak is cut it up fairly early in the process of after fell in the tree because the longer you leave it laying, again, the pith is their enemy. You see everything radiating out from that pith. So uh, that's causing all of our problem, but it starts cracking on you. So again, cut it pretty quick on it, whereas a pine log works better if you leave it laying, you know, so this is knowing your wood. So I still cut a lot of uh, this because I know how to cut it. I make board stuff out, projects out of it. While these rounds are up here, is I wanted to kind of illustrate some of the different ways you take a log and how you can cut it. There's more than one way. And most of this is for hardwoods. Uh, you know, that's what I, I usually keep so much of because that's what woodworkers want to think. They make very little stuff out of pine wood. That's a construction material mostly. Although I have some big yellow pine slabs. They've been down there for five years and hadn't had anybody yet ask me for a pine slab to make a tabletop when I've sold dozens of uh, black walnut slabs. So uh, we, we cut them all, but hardwoods are mostly in the slab stuff. But l let me illustrate a little bit about doing this stuff. One, one of the things that you can do is I get a lot and it's a popular thing right now, is natural edge boards or slabs, whether it's a board or slab. And the way you get those is you just start cutting. Say I'm cutting one inch boards, or if I, they might want two inch boards, but they want a edge on each side. That's one way of doing it. And y'all have probably heard there's our pit that we don't want. A lot of times I'll do this number. I'll skip that pith and cut on each side of it. Then after the board, this chunk of wood is out of the sawmill and I'm through with all my other cutting, I'll go back and stand this up and cut it into billets, usually the same height as they are width, so that you get a couple of billets and that way you get table legs or if you're in wood turning, you get salt and pepper shakers or uh, candlesticks or other things, tool handles if you want to make your own tool handles. So we don't even try to save that pith. We do this in a manner that that gets just stowed away. Firewood, save it for your firewood stack. That's all it's good for. And then we continue on. And there's nothing to say you can't cut one inch lumber and two inch lumber out of the same log. It's just a saw setting. So depending on what you need in your inventory, but with this kind of cutting, we're, we're leaving natural edge on. One of the other things that you want to do, a river table is very popular nowadays. 
And if you know what that is, basically they take two pieces of wood that's got some crooked edges on it, and they, they put them and pour epoxy in the middle, and it looks like a river flowing between it. Very popular table. And the way you do that is you take one side of your log and you cut it. That's going to be the outside of your table. And you're hoping this log is, you don't want a straight, you don't want it for a river table, you don't want a really straight log. You want a kind of crooked log so that it looks like the river flows. So we'll take off of this and leave that natural edge. And then you cut this board and you cut two boards the same thickness and you put the natural edges inside. And this will be the outside of your table. And that's very popular. And so we'll cut up some of them that way that can be turned into that. Uh, again, you can go down here, you can go back. And one of the things you can do is you can go ahead and cut your boards but those boards may be wider than you want. Once you've got that stack of boards cut, you can turn them up vertical on your sawmill and come cut them in half, and now you've got narrow boards for more practical use for woodworking projects. Now notice all of this really deals with uh, natural edge type board cutting. If you're not gonna do that, we can go in here and this one has a big problem to it. Again, the pith has caused an issue with our cutting. So what I can do here is uh, take this thing and square this one up and get rid of all the, the outside lumber on the thing so that I got a square beam. Well, this already wants to cut right through there, so I'll take and just cut it through there. By doing that, I end up with two huge chunks of wood. Now I rotate that and stand those up, and I can come in here and I can cut one inch lumber that's about six inches wide boards on that. Say I'm making one by sixes. By cutting it in half first, they just come right off there and I'm ready. If I want thicker stuff, I just readjust my saw and start cutting two inch thick stuff. When you get to the pith, try to, again, avoid the pith. And you can later on get some good boards here, but not here, later on on things. So, but this gives you, by squaring it up first, this gives you clean edges on all your lumber. So it's more like you'd go to a, a lumber yard and see in a big stack. So some people want that kind of material on the thing. Now, the other day I was watching a video and this guy on a sawmill was sawing up very small logs. And I kept wondering at why he was sawing up small logs given how much waste is in a small log. So I figured this segment will help you know a little more about sawmilling and what size logs you to use and how to go about it. But let me explain a few things about logs, and, and this is just general information. Charts can be found on the internet to confirm all of this. Uh, because I'm using different woods here, I really laid them all out just like they're uh, red oak logs. So everything com corresponds to them. So if you take, and you have an eight inch log, and you're trying to cut it up, If the log, all these logs are based on a 16 foot long log. If I take an eight inch log and it's eight inch on the small end and 16 foot long, I will probably get 16 board foot of lumber out of it time I end up cutting all the bark off of it and uh, get it into a square plane where I can cut a few boards off of it. So what it tells you is most of that log is going to waste. A large portion of it. And here's something a lot of people don't realize. If I take that eight inch log and I take, make it into a 10 inch log, there's over twice as many board foot of lumber in a 10 inch log as there is an eight inch log. So why are you cutting up eight inch logs when you've got more efficiency here? If you take a 12 inch log, we almost double this again, just on a 12 inch log. And this is the way lumber goes on the size of log. 16 foot log, 12 inch diameter, you can get 64 board foot of lumber out of it. So again, 
for efficiency of a sawmill, you're wasting a lot of time doing really small logs. If you take a 14 inch log over here, uh, a 14 inch log will have a hundred board foot in it. Look at there, a, a 14 inch log is, has nearly three times as much lumber as a 10 inch log. And it's only four inches more in diameter. Think of that. If we go to a 16 inch log, we jump again to a really big number, 144 board foot in a 16 inch log. So you see this progression across here, as you grow that log, you get much more efficient about your milling because you're throwing away less of the log. We got to square this log and you want to know what's left. You got very little left over here, but you're getting more and more. Now, if you go over here to this 18 inch log, you got 196 board feet, almost 200 board foot of lumber in this thing that is twice as big as this. So think of that. If we go to a 20 inch log, we're gonna get 256 board foot out of it. Go to a 22, it's gonna to jump to 324 board feet. 24 inch log, that, that's the, to me, that's the ideal log to if you can get them 24 inch log because you get so much more productive that's 400 board foot of lumber you're going to get out of a 16 foot long 24 inch log and then the big one if you find a 30 inch log and your sawmill will cut it up that's nearly 676 board feet of lumber in that log you can make some time on big logs but you got to have the equipment to cut them some people sawmill won't cut this big a log some of them will cut 24, some won't. Here's another thing to consider that you may think, well, I'll just jump to baking big logs. Well, that depends. Have you got the equipment to handle big logs? Here's about that. Our little eight inch log is 16 foot long, weighs only 435 pounds. Being 16 foot long, you can probably manually get that on your sawmill and turn it and so forth. If we jump that to a 12 inch log, we have nearly double the weight of that log. So 784 pound log, you can't lift it. You may be able to turn it or scoot it around with a crowbar or, or something else, but you really start to get into the category if you do bigger than 12 inch log that you need some equipment to help you handle those logs. If we jump up here to a 16 inch log, 1,480 pounds is what a green log will weigh that's 16 feet long. You're definitely going to have to have some equipment to handle that and move it and turn it. Now, if you have a hydraulic sawmill, it'll take care of the turning, but you've got to get it up to the sawmill. So 1,400 pounds. Let's jump over here to a 20 inch log. That's over 2,000 pound log. So how are you gonna handle that on your sawmill? It's great that you're gonna get all this lumber and board feed out of it, but how are you gonna handle the log? And if we go to a 24 inch log, we're talking about over a 3,000 pound log for a 24 inch one that's 16 foot long. You definitely gonna have to have some, not just a little equipment, one, not one of them little baby tractors. You're gonna have to have a full grown tractor to start picking this stuff up. And if you want to move this big 30 inch log, you better have some really heavy equipment because you're talking about almost 5,000 pounds of weight to move this log around. That's going to take some heavy equipment. Just as a reference point, I have a 52 horsepower John Deere tractor that I load logs onto my sawmill with. The factory specs say that it'll pick up 2,500 pounds on the front forks. I routinely pick up about 3,000 pounds with it, but then I'm doing some special stuff and often then the back wheels are off the ground. So when you start going over this measurement, 24 inches, you better have some specially heavy equipment. And uh, there's other ways to go about it. Uh, I can show you my old method before I got a tractor when I was dealing with these logs, but anyway, what I wanted to really relay to you is how much more efficient your sawmill is by using larger logs. But you've got a problem is you've got to be able to get the size of logs you can handle 
equipment wise because of their weight. Their weight is what's going to determine the maximum log you probably can put on your sawmill up to in here and then it depends on uh, how wide your cut is on your sawmill. Now every once in a while I hear people that come in and I hear this from woodworkers and sometimes sawmillers. They want to cut a log across the end into cookies, cutting it this way. And I hear the log a sawmiller saying, oh, that probably would make a beautiful table. And I hear some of the woodworkers say, well, you know, I sure would like a round table just out of a sawmill end. Uh, and then there's, it's real popular now to cut a salt log about this big around. And there's a the name the ladies have a, for it where you put this piece of log down and then lay a plate on it at a party and that's one of the things going around. So if you decide to cut some of these cookies, keep in mind this. This is a post oak log that's been cut about two weeks now. And as you see, it is almost totally flat, still. If you want to cut a sycamore cookie and give it two weeks to dry, do y'all see the big cup in this thing? How much it's cupped? Let's see, right there. That's in two weeks. If you want to cut a big piece of pecan for your cookies, do y'all see how much this thing is cupped? You can almost, almost, almost make a dish out of this one. The problem again is the pith that I keep talking about and how the wood is trying to dry around it. What happens though is wall wood is different so it dries and contracts and warps in different methods. If you decide you're going to cut up cookies or end cuts off a log, I really advise you to go cut some and store them away for about a month of different species and uh, find out which one isn't gonna warp all the way apart on you. Now, I was only showing you warping. What happens really, and most of them, is they'll end up making a big pie slit down the board and they'll just open up. So if you're planning on cutting a bunch of cookies and then storing them and selling them in six months, I'm pretty well sure you more than three quarters of them will probably be junk by then. If you're a woodworker and you think you're gonna make a round table out of these, after you get the table made, it's probably just gonna fall apart on you. The only successful tables I've seen out of those is where they have took them and impregnated them heavily with epoxy to stabilize them and glue them together. So uh, it's not really a good working, woodworking practice to try to use cookies to make tables and stuff round. Uh, sure is a lot of warp in it, but again, study your wood. Some woods handle this better than others, uh, but uh, sure is a lot of waste in cutting those and letting them dry. One of the things after you cut your logs up is you want to do, you're going to want to do is seal the end grain of your wood. Uh, now, I said after, you can actually seal the end grain of your logs as you bring them into your lot uh, before you get a chance to cut them up. It's a good idea to go ahead and seal them in once. Definitely after you get them on the sawmill and cut them up into lumber, seal the end grain of that lumber. Uh, most of your end grain or greenwood sealers, one of the more popular bands is Anchor Seal, Rockler's got one they just call Greenwood Sealer, but they're all made of basically the same product. It's usually emulsified wax with it. Sometimes they put latex in them and other things, but it's ideal. The ideal of them is to stop up the end grain of the wood so it doesn't, the end grain doesn't dry as fast as the side grain on the log or a piece of lumber, so therefore it doesn't destroy itself by cracking apart. I don't think. So, what we're talking about here is sealing this area, not this area. I see people occasionally will take a, uh, a board or something and just try to paint the whole board with anchor seal. Well, the board will never dry if you don't allow it to dry out the side grain. So really, we're only talking about the end grain. 
And also, you want to probably come over about an inch over to keep it from cracking on the edges. So end grain plus about an inch is what we're shooting for. Now, we'll show you how this is an end grain of a log. Therefore, we would paint the log if we were doing it before we sawed it up and then come back about an inch over the edge and there and let that slow down that end grain drying so this log doesn't crack as much. If you just lay your logs out, don't do nothing to them, come back six months later, here's what you get. Here's what your nice pretty log looks like six months from now when you didn't put end grain sealer on it. So if you're gonna keep your logs a while, especially the oaks and other things. Now, probably pine is the only one you don't want to seal. You really don't want to seal pine because you want that sap to dry on it, and they usually not bad about cracking anyway. So, the method. I've got this little doggy dish I've used for about eight years now. And cheap chip brush, and the anchor seal dries in there between uses. I usually try to kind of empty this out when I'm through wooing. But now that we're gonna start a new thing, all I'll do is take some greenwood sealer and put in this little dish. And then take the brush I've used before and just start moving it around a few minutes all the anchor seal that it dried in the dish and dried on the brush will reconstitute and get flexible. My brush will be flexible and we'll use up what's in there as we work here. But it doesn't take too much to do it. And then we can go right into coating our logs. The more you work that brush, the, the more flexible it gets. You can get as sloppy as you want, or be as careful as you want. There's the end grain of the log coated like it needs to be for you to keep it running. Then you want to kind of come over here on the edge and try to coat this edge around like that and make sure they tie into that end grain. If you do that, then you're pretty well assured you protect that log much as you can. Now, that's just a raw log. If you do your logs ahead of time there, and then take and uh, cut the log into lumber, you re it's a really good idea after you get the lumber cut to go back and put another coat of this on there. And that will help protect it. Now, that's logs. Now we cut a lot of turning blanks. And they have end grain. You can see the grain on this piece of wood going through here Therefore, we need to coat that and up here. As you can see, I've already done it. Coat this area. Notice I didn't coat the sides and we didn't coat the top. We don't want to do that or it'll never dry. We just want to coat the end grain with a little bit of overlap on it. And this is the same thing you're doing to your lumber. Coat the ends with a little bit of overlap and then that'll slow down the end grain drying Allow it to grind as dry as one piece and you won't have cracks in it. So anchor seal is just a part of, of sawmilling and processing wood. If you're a woodworker and you buy a board that's had that they've anchor sealed properly, you need to know one thing is anchor seals a wax. You try to make a project and you don't cut that off on a thing, your finish won't, won't stick to the board because it's got anchor seal on it. So anytime you see boards that have some anchor seal on it or, or a greenwood sealer on it, you need to, in the woodworking process, cut that just an inch or so off your board to get rid of that so that your finish will stick. 
So hopefully that'll help you on anchor seal, but it's a necessary thing you really need to do to your lumber. Now when you get through anchor sealing, you got product left in your bowl, uh, take it and pour it back in your container and wipe out what you can here and just put this up and you can reuse both your brush and your dish the next time you need to do this. Um, I had a buddy that come to me saying, yeah, you know, you can thin this stuff down and spray it on with a spray gun. It sounds real neat until you figure out you're putting so little on there it don't seal the end grain. I played with it, his ideal. I was not impressed with the coating I was getting. So no more, <laughs> no spraying of this stuff. This stuff really needs to be brushed on thick in the thickest consistency you can. So don't thin it down. When you get through, don't throw it away. Go ahead and clean your dish and pour it back in a jug and you're ready to do it next time again when you need to. Hopefully that's helped. If you like this video, please hit the uh, like button down at the bottom. Let us, let us know what you think of our demonstration here and all the trouble we went to to explain this. Uh, also subscribe so that you'll get notifications about the uh, upcoming videos. We got a whole bunch more of them coming where we're trying to explain some of this stuff. Hopefully it's useful. Be sure and give me your comments down there if you got any helpful information. This uh, video and other ones sometime are controversial because there's more than one way to do a lot of woodworking projects. So give me your view on it. Till next time, see you later.